1977, I went to the Madison building of the United States Library of Congress. There was no one in the building at that time. It was brand new. I was directed to a basement office where there were two guards and was admitted to the room. I thereupon found photographs, some dozen photographs, of what is unquestionably an unidentified flying object. I had been instructed that I was to take no notes and had to leave my briefcase and all my identification outside of this room. It was right in the sheet. He says, did you see that? Yeah, we all said, yeah, it was a nice display. What a show. He says, we documented them on radar. He says, we didn't give them clearance. We just, the standing order was let them fly through the radar beam. Hey, I got 12 to 15 UFOs outside, 50 to 100 feet above me. So I asked him, I said, what does it sound like? He took his head mic off, held it out the van window, and said, here. And the sound, the same sound I heard the previous morning, except a lot more of them. This is more about a human rights issue than just a UFO issue. Twenty years ago, this room would be empty. I see a turn in history. This is history in motion, but unfortunately, it's history with a security classification. In 1978, on January 18th, I was going into the base. Every morning, I did the briefing to the general staff, and I noticed that there are some lights off in the distance at the end of the runway. When I got into the command post, the senior master sergeant in charge said that there had been UFOs in the pattern all night. They're on radar. The tower had seen them. They got in aircraft reports and so on. And that one had landed or crashed at Fort Dix. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Stephen Bull. Thank you very much, John. Members of the press, the American public, and people of the world. We are here today to disclose the truth about a subject that has been ridiculed and questioned, denied for at least 50 years. The men and women who are on this stage and the some 350 additional military intelligence witnesses to the so-called UFO matter and extraterrestrial intelligence can prove and will prove that we are not alone. From your standpoint as a researcher and very knowledgeable person in this field for, in some cases, decades, how do you view the political process? Do you see something, do you see a trend? Do you see the potential for the government actually revealing this information to the public in some form or fashion? Are we going toward that? Are we going away from that? Is it a good idea? Is it a bad idea? What is the political status of this issue? Um, I think the political situation will change when everybody's a witness. Yeah. Or, if not that point, there will be some critical mass, at which point uh, a young fellow will stand up and say, gee, UFOs are real. We'll have the uh, emperor has no clothes syndrome uh, take over where everybody will admit, yeah, that, yeah how about that? That's really real. And uh, the government will admit it, but not until they see it's kicked in the rear end hard enough. Um, I don't think the government's going to ever uh, come forth with information that's, uh, I presume, being withheld until we have the answer ourselves. Then they'll confirm it, more or less. I don't really think that, you know, asking what the government should do is much of a question. I don't think that they're going to do anything. I see nothing in my uh, experience to show that the U.S. government is willing or interested or prepared to do any kind of disclosure of the UFO topic anytime soon. But I realize at this point that it's very secret, that it was kept secret because I asked him, what are you going to do with this piece of information? And he said, we always airbrush these out before we sell them to the public. So they're pes pesky little creatures uh, appearing on this uh, photograph they wanted to get rid of. Colonel Ray Walsh from Edwards Air Force Base was visiting Mr. Rattan, saw this, uh, this blueprint on the wall and registered quite a degree of shock and anger, wanted to know where the hell he got this blueprint because there was in fact such a craft at that time, approximately 1994-95, uh, in a hangar at Edwards Air Force Base. Cover-ups go on all the time. That is the way it is done in the world of intelligence. 
My, my God, we know, for example, of the CIA's old program, MKUltra, which was a mind control uh, program done in the 50s and 60s. We know about it by sheer accident, by a bunch of uh, boxes of stuff that weren't destroyed when they should have been destroyed. It's not that hard, actually, to keep secrets. The entire Manhattan Project, you know, one of the most significant scientific events of humankind, was done in total secrecy. They blew up the bomb in North America, and no one knew about it. Well, I don't feel that this can, can be covered up indefinitely. I'm convinced of that. And certainly, according to Senator Barry Goldwater, if you go back to 1975, when he was chairman of the Senate Intelligence Committee, he said there was a plan to release some of this material in the near future. And material certainly has been released on a regular basis. We don't have the crown jewels yet, but material is being released. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and members of the press. I, my name is Larry Warren. Uh, Twenty years ago, in 1980, I was a security specialist assigned to RAF Bentwaters, Woodbridge, NATO uh, Air Force facilities in Suffolk, East Anglia. I had a secret uh, security clearance. I guarded uh, our backline nuclear weapons that were stored there at the time. I, I went through a uh, portion of a three-night UFO event where objects made incursions over our WSA fired pencil-thin beams of light into them and adversely affected the ordnance, possibly. These objects were on the ground on two different nights. Potentially, there was another life form seen. This is an unpopular truth. You mean SAC is running a penetration mission? I said, no. I mean Cosmos. And uh, he says, okay, scram on your phone. So you pushed a button, and he pushed his, and I said, okay. And he says, what do you mean, you know, that you got a Cosmos contact? I said, <laughs> we got three flying saucers sitting out there. And then he proceeded to put photographs down in front of me, and clearly in these photographs were structures, uh, mushroom-shaped buildings, spherical buildings, and towers. And at, at that point, I was very concerned because I knew we were working at compartmentalized security. He had breached security, and I was actually frightened at that moment. And I did not question him any further. What I want to bring uh, to this discussion is the, uh, the general attitude, the little attitude among uh, scientists, especially scientists in the aerospace industry, um, talking mainly about SETI and how the SETI attitudes have reflected the NASA and government position for quite some time in that uh, ET is maybe here but cannot span the great distances of space in order to reach Earth. And this generally, uh, this general view was more of a protectionist viewpoint uh, for a, uh, a paranoid public that might be concerned about invasion because our own track record of conquest from various nations is that a new uh, visitor coming from another country was not necessarily benign. And uh, this viewpoint, even though it uh, has persisted for quite some time, had to go about a change, an evolution. As we became more capable of sending robotic probes out into space, it became more and more apparent that this would be the method that ET would use first in order to explore the universe. There were scientists and astronomers insisting that our solar system may be absolutely unique in the universe, which is a wild idea in itself of hubris, I think. Uh, and now, of course, we, we have over 100 new planets that have been discovered, which suggests that uh, planetary systems like our, are like our own are extremely uh, prevalent, which raises the possibility of intelligent life enormously. And so, in a strange way, the uh, people who practice debunkery amongst the scientists are finding that science itself is supporting us rather than doing the opposite. In the public perception, you get local newspapers reporting this. Everyone has to reinvent the wheel over and over again. I think people are not always aware that you're talking about not merely a national phenomenon, but a global phenomenon. The media, by reporting this phenomenon in a rational, non uh, in a ridiculing way can make a very big difference. Uh, the media um, 
You know, it's just, a lot of people will say, well, is there a conspiracy within the media to, to lock up UFO information? I would say the answer kind of is yes and no. I would say that on the beat journalists are not uh, of, you know, in the CIA's pocket. But I would say that if you study the media coverage of this phenomenon, that there appear, appear to be media choke points. By sending not astronauts out into space, but robotic probes that would send back information uh, on prospective uh, life forms or whatever their interests might be. And as we, as NASA, became more capable of sending these probes out into space and studying different planets, their uh, willingness to view ET as being equally capable came into play. And a recent uh, poll or survey was done uh, among SETI members, and of those who did respond, surprisingly, a large number of them, significant number, now feel that long distance uh, searches for ET using very expensive equipment over long periods of time is ineffectual, and that we should instead turn towards short term projects that are much less expensive looking for near Earth. Uh, visiting ET probes. Uh, we're not going to be able to prove it to somebody who doesn't want it proved uh, to them, but we certainly can demand that there be an investigation. That's, that's the bottom rung. Is the fact that the UN has been diminished in stature over the last 25 years, it has not gotten the kind of support, particularly from the United States, and has kind of been shoved out of, of the, the decision making and, and uh, uh, intermediary role that it could have held? Has that harmed the ability of the planet in general to address an issue of this magnitude? This is a subject I know well because even uh, having been family member, my father himself worked in the UN uh, many years ago, and my sister works currently in the UN. So I know that I know that institution quite well. But they cannot do anything. It has to be bring forth by a member country, the UN by itself. Now it is important to note that at the Grenada hearings, there was a decision passed. Um, 22-1, I forgot the exact number. It's in, uh, in one of the appendices of the UFO briefing document that was sponsored by Robert Feldman. There is a section there. The fact is, though, that there have always been statements by other governments, uh, often of a pro-UFO nature. Gosh, uh, almost 30 years ago, there was a statement by a, a former French Minister of Defense who talked about this in a very, very positive way. Uh, South American governments, the same. This is nothing new. Uh, the U.S. government is in a position where it's m more than first among equals and I think is in a very good position to uh, ignore anything that doesn't approach a crisis level and kind of hope that goes away. For the peaceful uses of outer space. That is an official committee at the U.N. that deals with outer space issues. And so that decision is still technically in the books. Now, it doesn't have any, let's say, power, but at least from the bureaucratic point of view, you, you don't have to start from zero. You can start for, because that was passed. That decision was passed. Morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Clifford Stone. I was Sergeant First Class, United States Army. I had a secret clearance with nuclear surety. I could get the clearance that I needed to do whatever it was uh, that was necessary for me to do at the time on special operations when I was called in on those. What I'm referring to here is that I was involved in situations where we actually did recoveries of, tra of crash saucers, for lack of a better term, debris thereof. There were bodies that were involved with some of these crashes, also some were alive. While we were doing all this, we were telling the American public there was nothing to it. We were telling the world there was nothing to it. We have lost control of these projects from a constitutional law perspective because the infrastructure within military intelligence and corporate channels is so well funded and so complex and labyrinthine that there are compartments within compartments within compartments. Good morning. My name is Carol Rosen. In 1974, after being a sixth grade school teacher, I was introduced to the late Dr. Werner von Braun in the U.S., the father of rocketry. In my first meeting with him during that first three and a half hours, he said to me, Carol, you will stop the weaponization of space. I'm a retired.